I declare the uh, committee meeting of council open at 5.32 p.m. Um, and the committee open advises that the meeting of the committee meeting will be streamed live and recorded for publishing to the internet. Please note the audio and visual recording is being taken off the meeting. This means that your presence at and your contribution uh, that you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed, or published publicly by council, including transferring outside of Australia. Um, council acknowledges that we're meeting on a traditional land, a traditional country of the Ghana people of the LA Plains, and that we pay respect to what is past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship with the land, and we acknowledge they are continuing importance to the Ghana people today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. Apologies and leave of absence. We have on leave Councillor Kuros. Can I please have someone move the confirmation of the minutes of the meeting on the 23rd of the 7th? Moved by Councillor Homer, seconded by Councillor Kanol. Any discussion or debate on the minutes? Okay, there's none. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All that against? Thanks, Karen. Uh, members, I've been asked by our administration that we consider an item in confidence first. Uh, dealing with item 9 point, sorry, 8.3, a property matter, yeah, is that correct? The 9.1, sorry, I apologise. Item 9.1, strategic property investigations, um, as we have external advice that we need to receive um, in that workshop uh, of council. Um, we need to be in confidence to be able to deal with that item. So if we could have someone move uh, for confidence on item 9.1, Sorry, Councillor, just one thing, let me just get clarity from everyone. You're, you're clear, Councillor Martin? Sorry, why are we dealing with 9.1 now? Sorry. Um, the CEO and staff have requested we deal with this item first because we've got external um, ah, advisors okay. that are coming in to provide a presentation for Council. And once we deal with that, we'll open back to the public. Um, our staff have also notified media that potentially that will be done in the beginning, so there'll be opportunity for them to attend a bit later. So we have someone move uh, to move into confidence by item 9.1, moved by Councillor Abrahim there, seconded by Councillor Ho. Any further discussion or questions? Okay, if there's none, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? Noted, Councillor Martin. Uh, can I please have the doors closed and any member of staff or public that
Okay, members, so we're dealing with item. Um, Councillors, if you want to take your seats, Councillor Hyde. Um, we're dealing with item 4.1, uh, Decluttered Streets, Naked Street Review. Um, members, we have a recommendation before us. Councillor, you're moving the recommendation. Seconded by Councillor Moran. Moved by Councillor Martin. Any discussion, Councillor? Oh, uh, no, not really. Just to say that um, there was a lot of debate about this uh, last year and um, what we've seen of the implementation of um, nude and decluttered streets has warmed my heart. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Moran? Uh, yes, I think um, uh, <coughs> the street that really exemplifies uh, that is Stanley Street, North Stanley Street, where, um, and also to commend Councillor, um, Area Councillor Wilkinson for his um, tireless um, support of the, this, this type of streetscape, and it does look lovely where it's appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Sims. Just a, a quick question, actually. Are, are there any um, issues that have been uh, raised? by people with vision impairment or um, those kind of issues that might be impacted by reduced signage? Is that something that's come up at all? Okay, so it's not something that we've had complaints about in the city of Adelaide, but I am aware that internationally and in the UK in particular, it's something that is becoming um, more of an issue, particularly around um, naked streets, more so than decluttered streets, just wayfinding for people with vision impairment. So how is that being, how would that be managed in terms of the City of Adelaide's approach if this is implemented? We would look to maintain um, clear desire lines along uh, building frontages, make sure there are no, no obstructions, uh, and working to clearly outline uh, defined crossing points, uh, perhaps with tactile indication, uh, similar to standard streets, uh, just in a more, uh, with more subtle approach. So just to clarify, administration would be comfortable then that uh, any of the issues that have arisen uh, overseas wouldn't be uh, issues in the city of Adelaide? Not at the moment, um, and it's something that we are taking into consideration uh, going forward in the future signs of um, naked streets and decluttered streets. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions, Councillors? If there's none, I'll go back to Councillor Martin to sum up. Um, yes, just to embellish uh, <coughs> Councillor Moran's uh, remarks, uh, it was uh, former Area Councillor Wilkinson who proposed this, and uh, the streets which are identified, I think, in 12, are all great examples of how this uh, this approach can work and work well. Thank you, Councillor. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. Uh, thank you. We'll uh, move on to item 4.2, 1819 Board of Four Finance Report. We have a recommendation also before us. Moved by Councillor Moran. Do I have a second, please? Seconded by the Lord Mayor. Councillor Moran, do you have any questions? Lord Mayor? Council, Council, Council members? Councillor Martin. Yeah, look, I'm just trying to get my head uh, around the Gaul Place extension. The, the budget which was approved at that extraordinary uh, meeting on the eve of caretaker was to be $17 million in total, 16 something, I'm not sure what it was, with no contingency allowance. And I do remember uh, the administration saying that it had been so thoroughly researched there would not be a need for any contingency funds. Um, are they saying, uh, the administration, that this $1 million, which is uh, brought forward from next year to the last year to cover this cost, will not go to the bottom line? It is not an additional cost? So if I could just have this through the CEO, please, thanks. Thanks. Um, thank you. Through the chair, um, in the Q4 finance report, there are two numbers that we need to consider for Gold Place. 
redevelopment. Um, the first number, which I think um, Councillor is referring to, is the $1.1 million, um, which is a timing issue in regards to the budget. So what I can report in regards to the Gawler Place Upgrade project is that we're actually running ahead of schedule, um, which has meant that we've incurred uh, more cost this financial year than what we had predicted um, across the entire um, budget for the project. So that treatment is just to bring forward some budget to um, essentially pay for the works that have been completed before the end of last financial year and no impact on the overall budget. And the second amount? Sure, through the chair. The second amount was for 962,000. Um, the components of that amount are as follows. So you're correct in saying that the $16.96 um, million dollar budget um, approved by council was excluding contingency and 662,000 of that deals with some contingent risks that have been realised on the project to date. Those risks are incorporating things such as an SA water leak, um, some unsuitable material underneath the pavement that was discovered um, when the construction was commenced and also um, there were some heritage footings um, unearthed in uh, adjacent to the Gawler Chambers um, section of work. So that's the type of thing that we need to deal with um, through the civil construction and, and that, as I said, equates to about 662,000. Um, the other things that we deal with within that figure of 962 is we're dealing with the um, costs associated with um, uplifting Featherstone Place, which is adjacent to the Gawler Place upgrade. And in addition to that, we've also allowed a small contingency of $175,000, which may or may not be incurred in the remainder of the project, but we prefer to treat it that way rather than um, coming back to council again. Let's talk about budget. And the contingency, which may or may not be required to one side, that 962 will flow through to the bottom line of 16.96? Or as part of, is that what you're saying? In addition? Through, through the chair, um, with the exception of the 175, which is a contingency allowance, the remainder would flow through to the bottom line of the project, yes. Okay, so the project has now blown up to around $17.8 million, is that correct? Okay, so it, it, it is an increase. And that will be funded, I understand, from, if I've got it correct, the MEMA that came to council is reprioritisation, which is deferral or postponement of roads, curbs and footpaths. Okay. Uh, look, Chair, I, I, I am disappointed this is blown out because, as you know, um, this cost was um, dying moments of the last council, bound this council for that expenditure, is now flowing through to infrastructure so that our footpaths and our curbs aren't being done in other parts of the city because of it. And it does follow uh, $30 million on Rundle Mall not that long ago. So we're talking about, you know, getting close to $50 million in the last seven years, um, along with uh, an annual cost of you know five six million dollars to maintain Rundle Mall, look after services, street clean, and so on. And I am just wondering whether this council ought to be thinking about privatising the management of Rundle Mall. It, it would be a way of getting some return for what is a substantial outlay in the last seven years and a continuing ongoing cost. Now it just might be that there might be a better approach, and I, I just wonder whether the uh, administration might look at that. Thank you, Councillor. So, uh, uh, Councillor Sims, you had your hand up? Oh, it was just a comment. Are we doing questions or comments? Uh, you, if you'd like to make a comment or questions, you'll... Yeah, look, I... Um, so just to be clear, we have a mover and a seconder. So we're, uh, we're, in, we're already in that... In debate in stage. Debate, yeah. uh, look, I just wanted to um, express my concern around the blowouts uh, to this project as well. You know, I, I can't help but feel that the previous council has booby-trapped this council by approving uh, this project at the 11th hour, um, so close to an election period. It is a significant um, investment. 
and um, I am concerned about the fact that we've got other public works that are not being able to be progressed because um, we're putting such a strong emphasis on this. So I don't know what the solution is, um, but I just wanted to voice uh, my concerns. It's not a fault of, um, of this council, but um, I think we, we find ourselves in a difficult situation. Um, and I, I hope there aren't further um, cost blowouts because um, it's going to make it more and more difficult for us to uh, expend uh, money on, on other worthwhile um, infrastructure projects. Thank you, Councillor Sims. The Lord Mayor. Um, I was wondering Sorry. if uh, Clinton, if you can sort of tell us if there are any particular projects that would be uh, not done as a consequence of that money moving over. Through the Chair, um, the treatment that we're proposing is to deal with this budget overrun through the um, Capital Works Program and the approved budget. The current treatment that we're proposing is to put aside some of the road resales um, that we have currently have allocated to complete this year into a holding um, fund so that we can fund uh, this additional amount for Gawler Place. What we've already recognised in the early inception and planning around the Capital Works Program is that we have a couple of projects that are already coming in under budget. So what we're finding is that we've already produced savings that we believe we can use to then refund the road reseals that we're currently putting on hold to do with Gawler Place. Excellent. So an example of that, if you, if you care for an example, there's um, a section of Parklands Trail behind the zoo that we need to go in and repair through our asset renewal program. Uh, we budgeted for that at 1.2 million based on our original assessment of the project and um, prices are currently coming in at about seven or eight hundred thousand dollars. So that's the type of example of where we're starting to see um, the ability for us to generate savings um, to, to resolve um, this issue. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Hyde. Um, is it standard practice, and this is to Clinton, I suppose, um, is it standard practice uh, for um, the City of Adelaide to go into projects without contingency funding? Uh, through the Chair, we normally deal on construction projects with two types of uh, risk. Um, often there are inherent risks um, when we are uh, estimating project budgets based on uh, maybe concept design plans or, or design plans that aren't fully detailed. Um, inherent risks um, normally attract um, a particular percentage of the contract value at the time. That could be between 5 and 10%. Um, and we deal with that um, at the time. We have dealt with that risk on this um, particular budget. What we haven't dealt with is the contingent risk so that is defined as things that are completely unknown to us at the time of um, allocating a budget. So, and that's what we're dealing with here. Typically, again, um, on a civil construction project, you would probably allocate somewhere between five and ten percent for that type of risk as well. And so, the previous council actively determined to, to so did they they carve that figure out, or was it never put to them by administration? Carved it out. No. Uh, through the chair. I I can't answer that question. Right, well, just, just, in, just in referring to that, um, I would say this is one of the only infrastructure, was the only infrastructure project. So, Councillor Hyde, you've asked the question. I'm going to yes. try to get an answer for you. Unless the oh, question remains you. floating, he can't answer it. Can we get an answer from the CEO on this? No, I'd need to take it on those and, and find out. Does the chair can answer it? Yeah, I can answer it, but I'll prefer to get an answer from the administration on this. So if you're happy to take it on notice, oh, yeah, I'll take an answer. We'll provide you an answer, please. Can I get an answer now? So, well, I can answer it. Sorry, Clinton, go ahead. Sorry, through the chair. I, what I can uh, offer is that the report that went to council on the 15th of September 2018 did identify that the budget figures provided were excluding contingency. So I can, I can offer that. Yep. So council endorsed the position of a budget, they didn't take it out, they endorsed the position without a contingency fund on the assurance that the project will not go over. Um, thank you, thank you, Chair. I would just say that that's the point of a contingency is in case it goes over. Um, and I think it's fair to say it's five to ten percent is a usual contingency. Um, and so if that contingency was in place, then we actually wouldn't be seeing a budget blowout. Um, at the moment. So I would just make the point that this is the only infrastructure project and I've worked on projects 
to the value of hundreds of millions. This is the only infrastructure project I've seen without any contingency budgeted. Um, I just make the point, particularly for those that were here last time, I suppose, um, and the administration, that this was a project that we already knew we had issues with as far as services and what have you goes. Um, uh, and evidently we didn't uh, discover everything that needed to be discovered. Um, uh, so I, I think it's, it's best practice that we do always have contingencies in place. I know I don't have to say that um, uh, to administration and that it was a decision of the previous council. I'd impress upon this council um, that we don't make a similar decision again. Any other questions? Yes. Miranda will summing up, I believe. Uh, yes. Before you um, do, if you don't mind, I just want to make a quick remark. Sure. I picked up on something that was uh, was answered before. Um, we are doing new works with this uh, extra money we're picking up. Is that correct? Because we, Featherstone Place wasn't included in the original Gawler Place uh, redevelopment. We are now picking up new work because that's something that councillors have not Pick it up on board. When did it come to council? Yes, it did. I heard it from. No, no, when did it come to council for an extension? It's tonight. This is what we're dealing with, councillor. So we're actually approving extra work. No, you're approving extra budget to complete resurfacing of Featherston Place, which wasn't part of the original scope of work. So Featherston Space is part of Gawler Place, but it wasn't considered in the initial parts of works. No, I got the impression it's done. Uh, it's no, done. that's not. That's that's what I'm trying to clarify yes, for the purpose does. of this room. So if I can get a question and, and answer through the CEO, that would be great. Uh, Featherstone Place is not completed. Yep, correct. At this point in time, 50, 60, 70 percent. Councillor Martin, I'm still not clear. So Featherstone Place is not complete, but are we? It's part of this budget request asking for funds that will be used for the completion of Featherstone Place. Through your chair, yes, part of the funds are correct. That, that's what I'm trying to ascertain. So this is not a, a complete rock. This is not a complete budget blowout. This is there is additional works that have been done as part of this project, and that's part of the request of the budget. The, the budget that's been asked today, Councillor Martin. Well, you've you've spoken, before. so you're asking a question. Yeah, no, I'm asking a question. My understanding is that a percentage of the works is complete, 50, 60 percent. Uh, or something of that order, and this is to assist with that expenditure which has occurred, as well as to provide additional funds, which is part of the blowout. If I'm wrong about that, please tell me. Sure. So let's get that clarified again. So let's really so, change. Just, yeah, just for clarification, <laughs> when you refer to 50 or 60 percent completion of what do you mean? The yeah, this thing. No. No, that's 10 or 20. No, no, Featherstone has the done commenced. Well, I thought I read one of the documents that we've started. Councillor, please direct your questions in this direction and on the mic so the public can hear it. Chair, I am saying that I believe from my reading of the documents and I stand to be corrected that work has begun. So, my understanding, and this is what I wanted to clarify because I felt that the room was heading in one specific direction where they felt that this is a, a budget blowout on an existing project. Correct? Part of this is a budget blowout on a project. However, part of this funds that have been requested by administration today as part of the budget consideration is to fund an additional scope of works for Featherston Place that wasn't part of the original plan. Okay, and Chair, may I ask then yeah. of what? Uh, what is the amount Your mic within? Oh, I'm sorry, turn it off. What, what is the amount within the 962,000, which is going towards the completion of the works in Perthston Place? So we can have that question answered. We're clear on that. So can we please get the three figures? There's a contingency figure, there's the budget blowout figure, and there's the Perthston Place works. Okay. The contingency figure through the chair is 662,000 which relates to the items that I spoke to before in relation to unknown risks on the project. 125,000 relates to Featherstone Place and 175,000 relates to an additional contingency request to deal with anything further that may arise on the project. All right, so we're very clear on that now. We are. Okay, so Councillor Sims, do you have a question? So a question of clarification. What would, be, um, what would be the implications if we didn't progress with the Featherstone Place component? Would that impact on the Gawler Place 
project as a whole, or would it be possible to say park that and just revisit it another time? So we see the works are being taken place at the moment on site. So that's a question to you, Clinton, through this year. Through the chair, um, we're, we're actually dealing with Featherstone Place in a separate report to council. So I'm, I'm just wary of, of that at the moment. In terms but we are being asked to approve it now. Uh, you are asked to approve this item uh, now with regards to, uh, you've got noting, so you're approving so, councillor, you are on committee mode, so you still have an opportunity between now and the council, provided the information you receive in the confidential item later may sway you in another direction. So, if this committee can deal with this item to either approve or not approve to council or recommend to council, if you are approving to new information between now and the council meeting, you will have an opportunity to change that decision. So, uh, councillor, I have a question you spoke about. Yes, there is a question, just quickly. Um, does that funding for resurfacing Featherstone Place, does that include any uh, funding for lighting? Uh, through the chair, not at this point in time. All right, thank you, so that's answered. Members, Councillor Moran was summing up before. Is there any other remarks or questions? So Councillor Moran, the floor is yours. I think the question to be asked, perhaps at council, I'm happy to continue to you know, move this. Um, <laughs> Uh, because I am in the lucky position as Simon's uh, that to have lived through this nightmare. Um, the initial um, cost, as to ask if Councillor Hyde, uh, was to spend the rest of the money for Rundle Wall on Gawler Place. I think that was in the range of 6.8 million. That's uh, the administration, none of who, who are here at the uh, now, um, went off and produced an $18 million redo. And uh, that caused a certain amount of angst in council. We were told to go away and do it from a range starting at 7.8, which was closer to the original amount. Came back with this um, amount. Um, there was certain, I'd say, anger about how the whole thing had been handled. And we were assured that there would be no more blowouts. So the council actually requested to, as a punitive act, as an act to focus um, the pro project to take out the contingency fund and no more spend money that you haven't got or you haven't been given. So it is disappointing to see here that another, why, why wasn't uh, this street done in the original? I can understand the, um, the rationale now that now we've got trucks there, we've got the stuff there, we'll do it was that one would have to ask, why was it deleted in the first place? And now it comes to us and we can't really say no, can we? So let this, um, I would say to people sitting here, let this project of Gawler Place be a lesson on how not to manage a project, both from the councillors and from the administration. But it's done now, so I think we just have to press on and, um, and uh, recognise that uh, we need to spend this money. But it's been a, it's been a, an awful experience. I can assure you, Councillor Hyde, that it wasn't done accidentally or with any um, sort of um, incompetence on the council's part. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Um, that is now summed up. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. Thank you, uh, Board Mayor. We'll move on to item 4.3, order making policy. We have a, a recommendation before us. If I could please have a mover of that recommendation, moved by Councillor Moran. Can I have a seconder, please? <coughs> Councillor Donovan, thank you very much. Councillor Moran, do you wish to speak? Councillor Donovan. Councillor Sims. Some uh, questions. It just wasn't clear to me what the differences were between this and the previous. Um, approach and um, I mean, I'm not asking you to go through the whole thing because I understand that would take some time but are there any kind of key headline issues that we should be aware of that is my first question and I've got a second one through the chair um we tried to outline the differences between this policy and the old one in paragraph five in the report. So essentially um, what we've done is really just bring the new policy in line with some of the legislative changes. Um, so does that, yeah, that yeah. Does so there's some things that are in the Local Nuisance and Litter Control Act now, which can be taken out of the order making policy and then some of the other things outlined in 
paragraph five. Thank you. Oh, just one other question. Um, section four, inappropriate use of a vehicle. Uh, to refrain from using a caravan or vehicle as a place of habitation. Um, there's going to be a workshop coming up uh, this weekend on uh, the tiny houses movement. Um, and um, there is a, a, a big movement uh, interstate, which I think is starting to get legs uh, here in Adelaide around um, small, tiny houses, but some of whom are on uh, wheels. Would they be captured by, by this? And if council were to do some work in that regard, um, would it be possible to change this easily? What would be the process um, around that? Um, through the chair, I think we yeah we'd need to see what the um, what the outcomes of that work would be, and whether or not um, a policy like this kind of inadvertently made that challenging. So if we needed to make retrospective changes to this policy, that would just require us bringing it back to council. Any amendments back to council for adoption? But at the moment, uh, under this that style of uh, tiny house, which is mobile in effect. Would that be captured by this definition? It's conditions here. Um, through the chair, um, for for this policy to take effect, it would need to be. So, if you look on page, um, I think it's eighty of the agenda. Um, it it describes in column two the circumstances that the order would. Could be relevant, so I think that, that would suggest that there wouldn't be conflict with the tiny houses. Work. Cool. Great, thank you, councillors. Back to you, Councillor Moran. Sum up. Sum up. Summed up. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour. All those against. That item is carried. Thank you very much. Item 4.4, .4, I have a recommendation before you, public notification of Category 2 development application. If I can have a mover and a seconder of this motion, please, moved by Councillor Moran. Can I have a seconder, please, Councillor? Seconded by Councillor Ho. Any discussion or questions? Councillor Martin. Uh, just uh, to uh, lament, um, Chair, that um, uh, this was a great service to ratepayers. It was a means of um, finding in one place, particularly for those who are not computer literate, notification of what's occurring in the neighbourhood. And unfortunately, the demise of the medium uh, makes it no longer possible. Correct, Councillor. Any other remarks or questions? Be it if there's none. Councillor Moran? I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That item is carried. <coughs> Item 5.1, uh, we have a, an IT business system roadmap and enterprise approach. Councillor Moran. I ask that, um, does this need a workshop? I mean, it's just really outlining it in light of the fact that we've quite a lot of, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> it is. Um, you love hanging out, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Do we really need a workshop? If members want to take it as read, I'm, I'm happy to, unless you feel like there's highlights you need to share. If members happy to take it as read. Okay. I've read it, but I've, okay, if, if you guys want to, you guys want to rush through a three million dollar um, investment. That's through the chair, I would, I would recommend a bit of time would be worthwhile. I know it's maybe tedious for some, but even just five minutes would be helpful. Even, even just a quick notes. So if we could just highlight some of the high level um, yeah. stuff there, some that would be great. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity to speak. I'll just this one. Failed with the clicker. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe I'll just kind of quickly go through sort of what the intent of what our intent was for taking an enterprise approach to the way that we do with our IT systems. Um, so the thing that we're trying to address with our IT systems is that currently it's a very complex uh, set of systems that we've got uh, and not all of them are connected together uh, and talking to each other well. The approach that we take through an enterprise approach is very similar to 
uh, doing a blueprint for a house. So what do we need to do to get a blueprint for the house? We get an overall view of what we want for the house, and then we look at the different layers within the house or within the blueprint to then look at how we connect our systems together. So the four key areas that we look after is around the business functions, relevant data, and then how the two systems really talk to each other. By taking this approach, instead of, uh, instead of a bespoke approach of, I'll buy a system here, buy a system there, buy a system there, this will take an overarching enterprise approach on how we want to do it. So using, maximizing the use of our IT systems to deliver the business benefit that we're trying to achieve. By doing that, we get the core, there's core eight principles that we want to go through, and we'll go through all of them, but in, in essence, it's really around making sure that uh, it's aligned to our strategic outcomes that we're trying to achieve for council. Uh, it allows us to be agile and be able to adapt to changes, also to ensure that we are open and transparent, uh, both internally and also externally to our community as well. At a very high level, uh, this is basically what our blueprint looks like. So on the on the very top of it, that's basically how we interact with our uh, with our customers. And below that are the are the core enterprise systems that we now need to look at uh, in delivering that. So historically, we could have multiple systems in each of those blocks. Now we're trying to simplify so that we get one core system uh, to delivering that capability. And oops. How would this really work? Um, so for example, this is if we want to do an online forms project, for example, we we use those uh, boxes as sort of like Lego building blocks. We, we put them together uh, to deliver the outcome that we want with our, with our, uh, with our solution. So what are the critical pieces of work that we need to do? Uh, basically, there's five key things. We need to ensure that we've got good governance, people, and processes to ensure that what we're delivering uh, meets the investment and the, and the benefits that we've identified. We need to go through a change process because all of this is change, and this is both change internally and externally as well. And then fundamentally, those the four key areas that we're looking at is around foundational systems. So what are the key building blocks that we need to deliver? How do we then deliver a rich customer experience? Look at internal performance and improving our internal systems and how we deal with that. And obviously there will still be a need for having the smaller systems for the bespoke solutions that we need. Um, what have we done today? So we haven't, so we have started on, on building our uh, building our house uh, and we've been chipping away over the few years around delivering those capabilities. What do we need to get the tar target today? Simply we've designed the business systems roadmap uh, so we know what we need to deliver over the next few years. We're working through obviously uh, a resource strategy and I'm making sure that we've got the, the right resources delivering the right things. And then also uh, in our long-term financial plan so that we've got an, an investment over, over a few years in delivering that roadmap. That's probably in a quick question. Thank you, any quick questions? Thank you. I did understand that, but I thought I'd be impressive on everyone else that need to understand it as well in case they didn't. Um, because, because I've, I've got to say, I've got to say, um, how many, how, how many, how many systems currently do we have? Different, different systems. Uh, through, through the chair, we actually, if you look at all the systems that we've got, it's over 100 systems. Wow. Um, uh, this is an incredibly important body of work um, and uh, relative to the amount we're spending on it, I think the efficiencies that we'll gain as an organisation um, are actually huge. I think it's something that should have been done uh, probably a long, long time ago. Um, and as well, uh, I see CRM mentioned there. Do we currently have an institution-wide CRM? Uh, we've got a, well, CRM, we've got a few smaller CRMs. Um, in the corporation, um, and we're looking at how do we look at getting that 360 view of that customer. So it could be through a CRM or it could be through some other data analytics options as well. So we're just still thinking through that because we know that the investment of CRM is quite a large investment. So we don't have an enterprise view of CRM yet. Yeah, okay. So you wouldn't have a timeline for when we might be getting a, a CRM institution uh, work? Not yet. So we're currently going through, uh, we've got a priority issue prioritization framework that we're going through and how we prioritize the, the list of projects. So there's about 23 projects that we've identified in the roadmap. We haven't yet prioritized all of that yet, uh, but that's the work that we're doing in progress. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just I just highlight that I think that's incredibly important. I know you put on the board customer, a customer-centric approach. 
Um, uh, uh, but for me, it, you know, it's it's about um, putting people before process, um, which I think is is a really important outcome of that CRM. Of course, I was I was very interested to sit through audit committee and learn that we didn't have a CRM. Of course, I was more interested to learn that we had to engage external auditors and pay the money to tell them that we should have a CRM. Um, I don't think we needed to do that. So you obviously understand that need. Um, thank you for the presentation and keep on with good work. Thanks. Councillor Sim, do you have a question? Yeah, look, I must be honest and say I'm not an IT whiz, um, but I, I did appreciate the, um, the presentation. I do my best uh, to um, try and keep abreast to what's happening. But um, that does lead me to my question because I often worry about you know, changes to technology and the digital divide within our community, in particular with, with older people who may not be um, across changes to technology. Um, <laughs> I was talking about myself, uh, oh, okay. uh, Council Nunn. Um, I'm just wondering, um, you know, what strategies there are in place to try and assist members of the community, whether that's within this uh, budget line or is that a, a separate strategy um, to help people who may not a, have internet access or B, maybe having difficulty um, with using the technology. To the chair, um, so the council does a, a lot of programs with the community around how we uh, upskill them and use the technology. So our libraries and community center does a really good job around providing training courses and uh, information sessions on how to use technology. So everything from your smartphones to NBNs to video conferencing. Uh, from uh, when, as we deliver services uh, to our community, we do take into account that customer first approach. So we look at the customers that this service is going to hit, and then uh, through a change management process, how do we ensure that we uh, maximize the benefit to as many people as we want? We also work closely with the access and inclusion uh, area as well, so to ensure that when we build IT systems and IT solutions that we try to take a broad brush or <coughs> make sure that we capture as many people as we can through that process. And then through our own uh, change management process or business readiness process, we, we try to provide as much information and training as required to the community and to our customers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll move on to the next item. 5.2, the Adelaide Parkland Building Design Guidelines. Uh, members, again, we have a, uh, a presentation here before us to introduce the committee to the updated guidelines currently under development, including the project background and draft design principles. Uh, members, again, uh, does anyone have any questions on this? So I'll provide the administration a few minutes to give us a bit of an update. Shanti, would you like to do that? Uh, thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. I have with me uh, Chris Diamond, who's been working uh, diligently on this piece of work, and uh, a presentation has been made to APCA on these guidelines. And so there are a number of steps in this process um, to, to get them signed off. Um, this is one of the steps, and I would like if Chris could just spend five minutes with you to present some of the thinking, particularly around the principles that um, um, we believe should guide uh, new buildings in the parklands. Sure. Uh, thank you, everybody, for the chance to uh, discuss this with you tonight. So I'm here to introduce you to the updated uh, parklands building design guidelines, which are currently under development. Uh, give you an idea into the project background and the draft design principles. And there's some uh, questions here which I'll see feedback or discussion on at the end. Just quickly, uh, your views on the proposed influence of the guidelines, uh, your views on the draft principles, um, discussion around is an identity appropriate for parklands buildings, and if so, how does Adelaide Design for Life fit with parklands buildings? So the 2008 Building Design Guidelines, uh, that's what this updated version will replace. This was uh, originally written by Tropo Architects and Oxygen Landscape Architects. It included design principles, objectives, requirements and recommendations, and it included direction on new or altered buildings delivered, owned and managed only by the City of Adelaide. It excluded state and local heritage buildings, public amenity buildings, internal fit-outs, uh, buildings delivered, owned and maintained by others, such as the state government, and major develop developments. The updated guidelines will include design principles, objectives, requirements and recommendations, direction on new or altered buildings delivered, owned and managed by the City of Adelaide and the state government, including major developments, 
uh, it will include state and local heritage buildings, public amenity buildings, internal fit outs, detailed site planning guidelines, detailed building design guidelines, comprehensive sustainability guidance, comprehensive smart building technology guidance, and comprehensive guidance to ensure that all buildings maximise community benefit. <coughs> issues that are facing some of our beautiful parklands buildings. There's a lack of universal access. There's a lack of facilities for women in sport. There's a lack of fit for purpose facilities generally. Um, many buildings are unsightly and aging. The form and placement of buildings is often poor and not maximised. For example, it doesn't align to the parklands trail and or other pedestrian and cycle links. Uh, building consolidation is required to reduce the overall number of buildings in the parklands. Uh, some buildings are perceived to have exclusive use. The footprint and floor area of buildings needs to be reviewed and understood. There's an increased city population, which means often there's an increase in sporting club members. Uh, building standards have changed. A lot of these can influence the size of buildings. The opportunities and constraints of, up, um, of undercrofting need to be investigated. Uh, many existing buildings have very poor environmental performance. There's septed issues and cultural awareness and alignment. For example, a lot of our parks, or all of our parks now have indigenous names, but very rarely do the buildings within those parks speak to those names. The future vision for parklands buildings. There will be contemporary architecture and architecture of the moment. Universal access will be standard. Quality buildings linked by the parklands trail and easily accessed by public transport, cycling and walking. There will be fit for purpose facilities. Flexible spaces to accommodate multiple simultaneous sporting and community events. Indoor and outdoor spaces that can be activated for fringe and festival events. Non-exclusive spaces. The parklands are for the community, so the buildings must also be for the community. And all buildings will invite the non-sporting community. They will be sustainable economically, socially and environmentally. Building, uh, buildings that support the City of Adelaide's carbon neutral actions. Buildings that embrace, embrace smart building technology. Buildings that align with council strategies and policies. Buildings that don't compete with parklands. Buildings that are strategically placed to create activity hubs while ensuring large building-free spaces within the parklands and even building-free parks. Architecturally designed buildings that complement their parkland setting through materiality, form, scale and typology. And buildings that strengthen the parklands identity. So we've developed some guidelines, oh, sorry, I've gone too far, some guiding principles. <laughs> Principle one is to celebrate the quality, identity and cultural heritage of the parklands. Principle two is to apply a whole of park approach. Principle three is to activate the parklands. Principle four is to be design exemplars. Principle five is to balance the visual impact of built form within the parklands. And principle six is to design with sustainability and longevity in mind. Here's an indicative program of how this project is tracking. Um, so we went to APTA in June, June, July, June, sorry. Um, and obviously committee now in August. The guidelines themselves are being, they're underway, they've been written. Uh, we're here obviously to seek feedback on background principles and objectives. It'll go to APLA again in September and then back to committee in October the actual draft guidelines themselves, and that's to seek support of the guidelines for consultation purposes and out for consultation in November and December. And then uh, feedback on that consultation, so we can edit that in January and February, back to APRA in March, back to committee in April, and, uh, uh, and with APRA and committee for endorsement of the actual final guidelines and then implement them around May next year. And so back to those key questions. Does okay. yeah. So you'd like some feedback from elected members on, on those key topics or questions? Yes, please. Yes. So members, we've got uh, three questions before us. So uh, does the committee have views on the scope of the proposed influence of the guidelines? So we'll start with that first, Councillor Hyde. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, and I think I made these points at, at APLA as well, but I'll just reiterate them for everyone, the benefit of everyone here. Um, I'm really keen to see uh, the building and design code, um, if not mandate, then very much encourage and incentivize undercrofting as much as possible. Um, uh, undercrofting, uh, soil buttresses, green walls, all that sort of stuff. I don't know if you've seen Lord of the Rings, but any buildings that are in there, I want it to look like Hobbiton. As green as possible is what I'm saying. And I think that actually folds a little bit into um, 
uh, when we're talking about identity for buildings, I think there's a, I think we are now at the point, um, and especially where everyone's going for experiences and they want those sorts of things when they when they go and do something new. Um, I think uh, landscape architecture is very important. So when we're considering the buildings, we need to consider the building in the landscape. I'd very much like to embed the building in the landscape physically, because I think that's the most sympathetic and complementary way to do them. Um, uh, but so when we're talking about an identity, I would say, yes, they need an identity, but it needs to be the identity of an entire, entire park or an entire section of park. Um, uh, I think that's that's the best way to approach it. And so particular parks will be known for particular things. Any other people? <coughs> Sorry, Councillor Councillor Lars and then Councillor Clark. Thank you. That was really interesting in the, the depth and the level of detail that you have gone to in terms of providing these principles, I think is exactly what we need. Um, in terms of the whole of park approach, I think likewise that that is really coming through in terms of the consultations that we've had recently that, um, you know, wherever possible, unfortunately, the way things naturally happen is different, different stakeholders are, are concerned with their little piece of the pie, but it means that we're not really seeing, well, how can we consolidate facilities? How can we ensure that there are toilets where needed and all those sort of things? So I think that's great that this is really looking to that whole of parklands approach. Um, the one thing in terms of the uh, draft principles that I would just have a little uh, reconsideration of in terms of the wording is the activate the parklands because one of the key things about the parklands and certainly for you know residents is that they are passive and we can have passive enjoyment of those spaces. So I appreciate it's just a tiny little nuance of the wording and certainly there are areas where activation is entirely appropriate and that is what we're looking for. But, um, you know, ensuring that we, uh, I think one of your words was around the, the built form, you know, maybe even some park spaces that don't have built form, well, hopefully lots of park spaces that don't have built form, um, and ensuring that that passive enjoyment is there as much as possible. And we're not just looking at what do the buildings look like, but we're really focusing at first on that. How can we minimise the amount of built form um, as the starting point? So it's Councillor Martin. Was that next, was it? Yes. Okay. Uh, you, look, I endorse uh, everything that uh, Ellen has said. Um, uh, I, we've had many discussions about the nature of buildings on the parkland, some of which look like toilet suites. Uh, and in fact, some of them were toilets that became expanded buildings. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, a lot of the buildings on the parklands are no longer fit for purpose and they're no longer fit for the parklands that uh, the South Australians uh, cherish and entrust us to look after. Um, the principles are fine for me. I take up the point that uh, Helen makes. Um, I don't think we should lose sight of the fact that for many people, parklands are passive. I'm not entirely convinced by uh, the Hobbit landscape that uh, um, was proposed by uh, Alex, um, uh, introducing mounds to what are by and large flat parklands um, seems to me to be a step too far, but undercrofting does have its place and greening does have its place around structures. It is also possible, however, to have a structure which is completely at ease in the environment of the parklands. Uh, and the truth of the matter is that we don't have uh, many of those that I can point to. Um, certainly not the uh, the surf club on Park 25. Uh, it does look like a surf club, and it's not at all sympathetic with the environment. But it is possible. Um, in conclusion, what what I would say is that we, as a council, have standards for everything from roads to footpaths to curbs, even to signs. And yet there is no standard, no minimum standard that we would accept for any structure on the parklands. So this will redress what I think has been a deficiency in the way in which we've looked after the parklands uh, for the time they've been entrusted to us. So good on you, go for it. Thanks, Councillor Martin. Councillor Six. My point's been covered. Councillor Thanks, Chair. Sorry, I apologise. Uh, uh, thanks, thank you, Chair. Um, look, um, 
aesthetics are aesthetics are a really difficult thing to articulate. Um, but I think looking at this at the principles, looking particularly at the illustrations, a lot is uh, a lot is conveyed from the choice of illustrations, uh, in my view. Um, I think that we probably would all agree that we don't want uh, a hangover the nineteen seventies. We don't want squat um, squat heavy concrete brutalist sorts of structures in our parklands. Um, are horrible to begin with, that's particularly horrible over time. Um, just looking at the illustration, what I'm getting a sense of is more uh, a leaning towards structures that are light, uh, airy, and with a uh, preponderance of wood panelling uh, as the, as all wood. Uh, you know. Would you agree that's a fair description of what's going on here? And, and, and do you think those are, that's terminology that's appropriate? Or principles, or is another way we can arrive at that sort of more concrete, more crystallised aesthetic uh, guidance, uh, if you will? Uh, through the chair, thank you. Uh, well, these are buildings in a park setting, so the materiality, materiality is critical. They need to suit their environment. We can't have the sort of cladding on materials that you'd see in London Hall sitting out in, in the parklands. Um, timber, the correct timbers that are allowed to grey off and age gracefully and detail beautifully can be very successful on, on uh, parkland buildings or you know, even farmhouses and that sort of stuff. So these are buildings in a park. They People go to the parklands to be in a park. They don't go to the parklands to look at a building. So buildings should be subservient to the parklands. People, you know, yes, it will be the odd building here and there, uh, but they'll, they'll be quite beautiful buildings and, uh, and they will sit very comfortably in the parklands. And I think through the language that we can use uh, in the building design in the building design guidelines through site planning and building design can really start to lead uh, into these outcomes but it's also critical that the language that's used is quite definitive so that we we drive the outcomes that we want if it's a bit airy fairy like i'll consider this or consider that people can say well we did consider it we, or like an architect for example could say we did consider that we decided against it we're going to do this we think type language in the building design guidelines will get the outcomes that we should be looking for. Councillor Cole. Here we go. Um, and it says thank you for the presentation as well. Um, and uh, I, I did quite enjoy it. I mean, uh, I, I like the idea where we're now looking at their parklands, we've, we've given them uh, in a lot of Aboriginal names, etc. And I think uh, uh, there is, you know, the, uh, the ability to coordinate a little bit more, you know, because. Uh, you know, we've got so, all sorts of purposes in the, in the parklands, and that's very good. And, and obviously, for all the different uh, uh, groups, it, uh, for me, I, I would like it, it would be nice to be able to reflect a little bit of the, the heritage, a little bit of the you know the, the uh, Aboriginal culture, etc. Because we are trying to express that anyway, um, and it would be uh, you know a nice touch besides the actual built form, but it's also it's got to sit into the, into the into various areas. But those areas can also mean something. I mean, I've been you know, fortunate to be going through a few of them, and I think uh, if we're able to do that, and then in that cohesive way, create a, you know, an environment that is diverse, but yet uh, still has uh, a thread through there that makes it uniquely, you know, uh, from Adelaide, from our parklands, um, that uh, you know, when they want to do the World Heritage listings and things like that, that you know, these things then can be something that we can sort of uh, use as a, as a whole um, of an opportunity uh, across all the different ways we. we Think of it. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I think we've sort of covered a bit um, outside the second and third question as well. Do you feel like you got enough feedback there from councillors, or do you do you have anything specific you'd still like to ask? Uh, thank you. Yeah, through the chair, I, I'm happy with that. I feel yep. that everybody is is on board, <laughs> and we're heading in the right direction. So we'll keep going. I look forward to presenting uh, the guidelines back to you as they develop. Thank you very much. So members, we're moving on to uh, item 7.1, that's exclusion. So we're dealing with item six. Sorry, Councillor. Item six. Yeah. Um, matters uh, that councillors may wish to raise in the context of. Yeah, I apologise. That... Sorry, Councillor. No, it's all right. It's all right. I was looking at my index and I'm sorry I'm not feeling 100%, so I'm a bit uh, under the right. weather. Sure item six, council member discussion forum items. So that gives the opportunity for council members to, uh, to have a discussion. Go ahead, council. 
Well, um, look, I, uh, thank you, Chair. I was going to ask the administration whether it might not be possible to consider the criteria of uh, council for things like civic receptions. I, I am aware that we had one on Friday uh, for what I uh, observed was a busload of developers who came into the Queen Adelaide room um, to celebrate uh, the construction of the new uh, Hyatt Hotel in Peary Street. While at the same time, uh, recently, the council opposed that development uh, and told SCAP that this proposed uh, uh, demolition of the facade on the building here was not consistent with the development plan. So it seems to me there's a contradiction where we take a public position on uh, development and then we have a Lord Merrill civic reception for people who are doing the things that we don't want them to do. Um, it seems to me to be a mixed message and I just wonder whether we need to have some criteria uh, about civic receptions to ensure that we're not um, signalling to others who, you know, likewise do things with which we disagree, that all is forgiven, come to town hall. Uh, I, I have to say, I did wonder as I was watching uh, this thing unfold, you know, will we do the same thing to the Adelaide Oval Hotel? Will we get over our angst and have a civic reception for the, uh, the Oval Hotel? Uh, I think we need to look carefully about what we do in, in terms of those public events. Okay. Thank you. Noted. So uh, for, for members just on this item, this is like uh, airing your grievances for three minutes, if you want to look at it this way. Uh, <laughs> but there won't be an opportunity to, um, any questions obviously on notice or without notice have to go to the chamber. There won't be an opportunity for the, uh, for the item to be debated and there also won't be an opportunity for the administration to respond back. However, there is an opportunity for the administration, potentially in this case, the Office of the Lord Mayor, to contact Councillor Martin and to uh, to deal with this issue or provide all the information that's required. Councillor Hyde, am I able to share my views on no, this matter as well? Not on this issue. No, no, we can't. So, but no, you're not debating the item. You've got anything you'd like to have a discussion about for three minutes. You're welcome. Um, I'd just like to air grievances about grievances that were previously aired. Um, and in doing so, I would like to I would like to congratulate the city for hosting um, uh, those people who are uh, well those developers who are creating um, uh, that new hotel uh, on Piri Street just down the road. In doing so, I would also like to to add uh, some sort of legitimate grievance in that in that scap and it was scap that is tearing down the heritage facade, not us. Um, scap decided to do that. I'm aware, obviously, that we opposed it, um, uh, but uh, it's SCAP that's erred in their judgment here. Um, of course, I think the city should always be welcoming investment, uh, particularly foreign investment, um, uh, coming into coming into uh, you know our boundaries because I think it adds wealth um, uh, to us all. Thank you, councillors. Councillor Moran. I'll just be very brief. My grievance echoes. Um, uh, councillors, I can't allow this. This this is. Councillor Hyde, I think you've overstepped the mark. I was I was hoping that you weren't going to go down this path. This is not a uh, dialogue and a debate on this item. We can't allow that. But the whole purpose of the three minutes is to give an opportunity to elected members to be able to bring new information to the chamber about the community and to talk about issues that raise the community. Okay, I've got another one then. Um, I, just, <laughs> I just want to uh, express my extreme disappointment of getting a motion up to put a traders car park on the Lacornu site free of charge for the traders to find out that it has neither been actioned nor considered. Um, I've spoken to the CEO about it and he's offered some um, that to th rethink it. But seriously, when we get when the effort is get to get our colleagues to vote for our um, our motions, it is very disheartening to find that there's no action on it and was never intended to be any action on it. And I'm very, very angry about that. So look, this is becoming rather challenging because I can't give the opportunity to the administration to respond to remarks made, claims made, be it factual or not. Um, it, is, it is challenging. So it's really important that councillors, when they're airing the issue, to talk about uh, that we need to be able to be well informed. So I have, well, just to follow that up, I have discussed that with the CEO. He affirmed that that was the correct that that was happening. Uh, we all got a memo the other day saying what was happening on 88 O'Connell Street. Councillor, do you want to use your mic? 
and uh, that said that it was going to be activated um, and that the car, only car park existing on it would be as an ancillary to activation. So I'm not speaking as something that I'm just guessing at. Sure. My, my resolution of council will, has been ignored completely, which is very embarrassing for me because I've been down the street, I've told the traders. So councillor, I need to, I've got okay, this. I've finished, I've done it. Thank you very much. <coughs> councillor Sims. I just wanted to uh, highlight to members that um, on Sunday I'm going to a workshop about <coughs> small and tiny houses. Um, I mentioned it earlier in, uh, in questions, but um, what, no, it's not a grievance, it's a, it's a discussion for what I like. This, this is exactly the type of information we need to receive. I just wanted to let people know. Oh, <laughs> We're not talking about tiny things. Go ahead, Councillor. Oh, it's very engaging. Um, I just wanted to let you know that, um, that I'm doing that and if anyone has any uh, feedback or issues they want me to raise, uh, please let me know. Um, and um, likewise, I'll come back and report on, on what's raised at the workshop because um, Melbourne has, has been dealing with some of the challenges around uh, red tape and so on um, in terms of getting this kind of housing happening in their city. So I'll be looking forward to sharing the learnings with you. Thank you, Councillor. Members, any other remarks? Thank you. We'll move on to the following items. Item 7.1, uh, items to exclusion to the public. We're dealing with item 8.1. First, to the 1819 quarter four commercial business operational report. And I've asked for a mover, moved by Councillor Moran. Seconded by Councillor Kira. Any discussion? I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That's carried. Item 8.2, Rymel Park Kiosk EOI results. Um, again, a mover. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Seconded by Councillor Hyde. Any further discussion? Be it that there's none, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? Councillor Martin, I see consistently you would vote against the confidential item. Uh, that's a good news story. I don't know why we're keeping oh, it to ourselves. On merit. Item 8.3, property matter. We have dealt with this item. Sorry, we haven't dealt with this item. 8.3, property matter. Um, yes, we did. No, we dealt with 9.1. Oh. So again, can I leave the door open? Sorry, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, item 8.3 again, the mover. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sim. Seconded by Councillor Canole. Any further discussion? I'll put that in confidence. All those in favour? All those against? Councillor Martin, yes, that's it. That's carried. Uh, members, um, all members of public and staff that are not directly.
Members, I would like to declare the meeting closed at 7.39 p.m. and I thank you for your attendance.